Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge, congratulations on your nomination. Uh, I, I have to say I'm confused by your exchange just a moment ago with Senator Cruz on the death penalty. So you're, you're in favor of the death penalty personally? I can't indicate a view as a sitting judge and a nominee to the Second Circuit. What I can indicate um, is that if I have a death case as a, either a sitting district judge or should I be confirmed to the Second Circuit, I will fully and completely apply the relevant statutory law. Wait, but you have indicated a view in the past. That's why I'm confused by what you just said to, to Senator Cruz. You've, you've filed numerous amicus briefs. You've written a chapter in a book, the story of Roper versus Simmons, where you praise the Supreme Court's decision there on the death penalty, which forbade the death penalty for crimes that were committed uh, but when the uh, when the criminal was under the age of 18. So I, I'm just trying to figure out, have you changed your view, or, or what, what, what's the story here? You, you used to be opposed to the death penalty, and now you're for it, or now you don't want to talk about it, or what, what, what's the deal? The um, articles that you're writing, I wrote in the context as uh, academic or uh, litigation as an advocate, um, as a judge, Ten years I've been on the bench. As I've said, I have had death eligible cases. I'm fully and completely prepared to implement and apply. I, I understand all of that, Judge. I, I got that. I heard that. But but I'm I'm asking. I'm trying to figure out here what your view is on the death penalty. You've talked about the death penalty. You've written about it. You've advocated that. That doesn't magically disappear when you get nominated for the Second Circuit. And I think it's pretty fair game to talk about your past writings and statements of positions you've taken. So I was what, what caught my attention was you wouldn't say to Senator Cruz, you made it sound as if you're for the death penalty. I'm trying to figure out if you've changed your position or if you're just not willing to talk about your past articles. I mean, what, what, so what, let me just come back to it. Are you still against the death penalty? Senator, uh, my writings in the past or advocacy on behalf of clients made legal arguments I actually don't think I've ever indicated in writing that the death penalty was unconstitutional uh, or the like. I made specific legal arguments, uh, and in the case of the chapter on Roper, I analyzed the Supreme Court's decision in that case. Um, but what I can tell you, Senator, is in this area, um, as a sitting judge, I have had death-eligible cases. Uh, I am fully prepared to implement congressional law uh, uh, consistent with the death penalty. Let, let me ask you this. In your book chapter on Roper versus Simmons, you, you praise the fact that the Supreme Court relied on international law to uh, cut back on the application of the death penalty. Do you think judges should rely on international law in other areas as well? Is it fair, if they're going to rely on the death penalty context, is it fair to look to international law in other areas of the law? As a judge um, interpreting and implementing U.S. law, the U.S. Constitution, U.S. Congressional Statutory provisions, you look to U.S. law, not foreign or international law. Well, you're the one who praised looking to international law. So have you changed your view on that also? I wrote an article back before I was a judge as an academic about looking at what the Supreme Court was doing in invoking international and foreign law. Um, uh, and I analyzed it in that context as a... As a, um, I, I, don't, I don't understand how the truth or falsity of these things changes based on where you sit. Either it's true or it's not true. Either you praised it or you didn't praise it. It, it doesn't change because you have a It doesn't change because now you want a new job. With all due respect, Judge, you praised the application of international law. You've particularly singled out the fact that a Chinese delegation was present in the Supreme Court chamber the day that Roper versus Simmons was handed down. You spent an entire article praising the court's use of international law. So please don't suggest to me now that you didn't do that or that somehow being a judge now and wanting a spot on the Second Circuit makes that irrelevant. Frankly, I think it's a little irritating that you're fencing with me this way. So let me ask you this. If, if, the, if the Supreme Court's going to look to international law in the death penalty context, why not in the abortion context? Do you think it's relevant that we are one of only seven nations that allows abortion past the stage of uh, fetal pain, for instance? Do you think that's something that courts should consider? Senator, I would consider what the Supreme Court and the Second Circuit says is relevant to those considerations. Um, and I can, I think if you look at my record over 10 years as a sitting judge, the thousands of cases I've decided, uh, I've looked to American law in interpreting the American Constitution. So let me ask you one final set of questions here in the brief time I've got remaining. Let's talk about one of these cases, these COVID cases, United States versus Tucker. This is where you reduce the sentence of a person that you said had committed a very serious crime that's your word, 
His criminal record was 30 years long. The most recent reason he was in prison was he had been a gunman, uh, used a, 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 a gun and a violent crime and a planned robbery. You said that it was important to reduce his sentence because of the extraordinary and unprecedented threat posed by COVID. Now, he'd already had COVID and recovered. He was also fully vaccinated. You didn't release him, however, but you reduced his sentence. I'm curious about that. Why would you not, if, if it was an extraordinary threat, COVID was, despite the fact that he'd had COVID, recovered, and was vaccinated, why, why would you just reduce his sentence? Why wouldn't you release him? I'd, walk me through that logic. Sure. Um, I denied the request for release, uh, in part for the factors that you've indicated. Under the relevant statutory provision, you do have to go through and engage in the analysis under the 18 U.S.C. Section 3553A factors. I did that taking into account the arguments made by both sides, the record that was in front of me, and concluded uh, that a one-year sentence reduction was what was appropriate. Uh, I've sentenced over 270 people in my decade on the bench. Uh, I've imposed substantial sentences, and I've done that um, taking into account the factors that Congress has indicated I'm required to take in, into account in exercising that judgment. Thank you very much.